Sir Silverthorn had a blue tunic that under his armor he wore. It bore all the brunt of his fighting, and many blows suffered full sore. For many years he had worn it, and it never had needed a wash. If it ever grew stiff or fragrant, he'd just beat it until it was soft. It was Silverthorn's blue fighting tunic, the one we recall to mind. Sir Silverthorn's blue fighting tunic, the one that was left behind. It was after a practice one Wednesday when the great knight unpacked his bag. He had gathered his kit in a hurry in haste to saddle his nag. His blue fighting tunic was missing. He searched, but it could not be found. Sir Silverthorn was not forgetful. He'd never lost hawk nor hound. His, the tunic was wrapped in a bundle back at the practice hall, the place where the populace gathered each week to answer the call. It sat all alone in the darkness, forgotten behind a chair, until a silvery shaft of moonlight illuminated it there. The tunic glowed in the moonlight. It seemed to shimmer and shift. And then, in the silence, it quivered. And then it began to lift. The tunic arose in the moonlight, and there it slowly unrolled. It turned to its left, and then to its right. And then it went out for a stroll. What magic was moonlight making, making that thus animated a shirt? It was only an old fighting tunic, encrusted with sweat and with dirt. Ah, but this was Silverthorn's tunic, which at long, at last, at length, had become saturated with power, with pungent prowess and strength. The tunic sailed through the city. It flapped like a proud battle flag. It was seeing these sights for the first time. It was usually stuffed in a bag. It came to the banks of a river, a river that twists and turns, a great river for a great city, a river that occasionally burns. The tunic stood in amazement amidst all the ships and the cranes, for the tunic had never seen water, except as occasionally rain. The tunic stood there and wondered what would happen if it went for a swim. But the tunic was ripe for adventure, and so the tunic dove in. Now, you might think our story would end there. The magic would all wash away, and the tunic would float down the river, and I had naught else to say. But this was the Crooked River, a river of fire and ice. And there are things in the Crooked River, things not noble, not nice. The dark current savaged the tunic till its goodness was utterly spent. The tunic now twisted and evil on mayhem and pillage was bent. It boarded a merchant vessel by climbing the anchor chain. It flung itself at a crewman who shrieked in terror and pain. He called out for aid to his shipmates. They rushed to his side, but then this was Silverthorn's tunic. And it had the strength <coughs> of ten men. <laughs> One trusty old sock saw the carnage, and he knew how to handle the score, for he had once been a fighter. Why, he'd served on the Carrick Moor, that great floating shire of legend that sailed the seven seas with nuclear-tipped rattan weapons and pennons in the flight deck's breeze. <laughs> he ran below decks to the laundry, and you know what happened next. One cupful of soap, and that tunic collapsed in the heap on the deck. And thus ends the tale of the tunic that briefly knew its own mind. Sir Silverthorn's blue fighting tunic, the one that was left behind. Uh, so the backstory to that poem. I got home after a Wednesday night practice in Clefmans, and I checked the message box. And there was a message from Sir Silverthorn that he had sent in haste to every member of the barony 
between the ending of practice and the time we got home. Has anyone seen my blue fighting tunic? I can't find it. The muse did the rest. <laughs> Cautionary tale. Bards don't need much to go on at all. <laughs> and when Brendan woke up 15 minutes later, 